Heidi ho I'm Uno Clay from Philadelphia, and I support Gen X Grown Up on Patreon. In a world torn apart by angry pundits and ceaselessly acerbic news, the cheerful tone of Gen X Grown Up is always a welcome escape, not to mention endlessly entertaining, and sometimes even informative. If you want to support the show too, click on genxgrownup.com slash Patreon and toss them a couple bucks. It's the guaranteed way to gain the respect of your peers and immediate promotions at work. Not guaranteed in all 50 states. Some employers may see fit to demote you, and your peers will probably find you weird and distasteful. Results may vary. You are warned. No life, no fun. Don't you know that you're a grown-up? Gen X Grown Up is a YouTube channel website and audio podcast you're listening to right now. All made for and by people who love exploring media, games, tech, and toys of yesterday and today through the eyes of Gen Xers who refuse to grow up. Your dinner cannot just be french fries. Basically, life sucks as a grown up. Welcome back, Gen X Grown Up Podcast listener, to this episode 151 of the Gen X Grown Up Podcast. I am John. Joining me as always, of course, my friends and colleagues, Mo is here. Hey, everybody. And you know that George is here. Hey, how's it going, guys? In this episode, we strike out for the New Mexico desert to see how the dawn of the atomic age translated to the big screen, unearth a 40-year-old electronic toy based on a classic arcade machine, and take stock of all the new games we acquired at this year's Southern Fried Gaming (laughs) Expo in Atlanta, (laughs) from which we have all just returned, and was the reason that we took July off to deal with convention season at the same time as pods is always tough, right? (laughs) I mean, dealing with sounds like we didn't like it, but I think we had a great time. I I think this was my favorite SFGE ever this year. Oh, yeah. I had a blast yeah. this year. Oh, you're right. When I say dealing with, I just mean there is effort involved. It doesn't just magically happen, right? Yeah, there there was definitely effort. There was some uh, some last minute technical stuff that we all threw <laughs> together and it, it was a lot of fun. We learned a lot by doing that. Yeah, yeah. We, we tried to live stream our panels. They did live stream. Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. The, the camera was adjusted weird sometimes. The audio wasn't perfect. Look, we really just wanted to share it. And yeah. we did yeah. successfully. And now we have learned better how to do that. Uh, we will actually have the audio portion of those panels available as bonus episodes here on the podcast feed before Ooh, too long. So oh, okay. that'll be a long because we did record them. Um, and uh, I've wasted time here. We're going to get into this show. But yeah, yeah. we got while we're talking about SFGE, we're going to talk more about SFGE. SFGE later in the show, I know. But this year, we got a chance to see so many of our longtime friends, family, and fans that we've met through Gen X growing up, most of them who were huge in in Discord that hang out with us. And we had people coming from Wisconsin and Kentucky Mm -hmm. and Ohio and Pennsylvania Mm. and all over the place. And I don't mean just, hi, how are you? Shake our hand. We got to sit and play games. We broke bread together. We got to cut up. We went to the dance together. Phenomenal experience. You're right. The best SFG. Met their families, too. Yes. And meet their families. Please. It was awesome. So, so much fun. It's the best part of SFGE was the people. It always mm-hmm. is the people. <laughs> you mentioned going to the dance. I just got to throw this out there. My wife and I have been married for 22 years. When we got back to the hotel room after that dance, she said, honey, that's the first time you and I ever went to a club together. I'm like, "Eh, I don't know if that was a club, but you're right. That's the first time we went to a musical thing where we danced. You're married to George. An 80s cover band at a nerd convention is about as close as you're going to get to a club with George. So take it if you can get it. (laughs) Yeah. It's good enough. And it was awesome. Guardians of the Jukebox kick ass. I love Mm -hmm. that group. So much fun. Yeah, two hour stretch of lip syncing and mm. screaming along with every song that I knew every <laughs> word to. Never got old. Yep. <laughs> okay, before we get into the rest of the show, since we now spent 45 minutes talking about how awesome SFGE was, <laughs> and it's worth another 45 if we had it. Uh, mm. Before we jump into the show, time for some quick fourth listener email. The fourth listener this time around is Kat, mm. not only a patron, not only my co host over on 1980s now, but you guys got to meet her for the first yeah. time at she's SFGE. Awesome. Yeah, she was awesome. What a yeah, sweetheart. Did not right? stop dancing for the entire entire two hours. No, no. And, and a further hour on either end of the of the show, she was also dancing, I'm pretty sure. So. <laughs> she, she's warming up and cooling down. Yeah, she had a phenomenal time, just like we did. Anyway, Kat did write in. She wrote in the subject line, The Raiders Backtrack. So uh, not mm-hmm. long ago, okay. we did one about mm-hmm. Raiders of Lost okay. Ark, right? So here's what Kat has to say. I'm with you, John. Just as you said, I want to see that after hearing there was initially three hours of film footage before editing. I had the same thought mm. in my head. Okay. 
she then said, I enjoyed Mo's story about his two very different ticket purchasing experiences oh, for Raiders okay. of the Lost Ark. Yep. Uh, and I feel quite certain I disagreed with George about something. I just can't recall what, what it was at this moment. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, most no people can make that statement, nice right? to Cat. That's some bullshit, Cat. I'm just saying, I'm glad I flipped you guys off in your panel. Uh, <laughs> and they enjoyed it too so i'm sure it was yeah, yeah, like it was <laughs> oh that's good yeah we have a lot of got a lot of good feedback on our raiders backtrack and, and plus we had a lot of good feedback that you'll be hearing over the next few episodes from the rewinds we did during our july hiatus uh, we didn't stop feeding you good stuff we had some old episodes from um i don't know like three or four years ago yeah, we, we uh, put old. in the feed with new intros. So if you saw that and you're like, I've already seen that one or heard that one, there's uh, new intros on the head of those where we talk about remembering recording them in the first place. So <laughs> if you're a longtime listener, something cool there for you. Kat, thank you so much for taking the time to write in as our fourth listener. If you would like your email featured here on the show, it is drop dead easy. All you have to do is fire off an email to podcast at genxgrownup.com. Read every single one. And most of them, like cats, will eventually make and the show. make sure mm. you dance with us at a convention and we'll definitely read it and on for That's sure. Right. That's a, absolutely <laughs> nailed it. That's right. Can't miss it. All right. With that good business behind us, let's jump into the body of episode 151 right after this. Hi, this is comedian and writer, and let's be honest, I do a lot of things. This is Dean Archipotus, the host of Whiskey Business, the podcast not so much about whiskey as it is one with whiskey. Yes, we drink and talk about whiskey, but we do so much more with so many interesting people. For example, we talk to comedians like Greg Warren. You know, I don't want to brag, but let's just say I can walk into a Red Lobster and get whatever. You know, I think the pause right there is probably more important than the word. Amazing athletes like boxing champion Buster Douglas. When a fighter's down and he's looking for his mouthpiece instead of trying to get up. That's when I knew it was over. Yeah, yeah, right? And yes, Bigfoot chasers. Do you believe in Bigfoot? And if so, does he really eat beef jerky? <laughs> the Bigfoot thing is people have seen these and, and I've seen a lot of compelling evidence about it. It's Whiskey Business with Dino Tripotis. Join us for what we call a good conversation with a good pour. You really can't ask for much more than that, can you, people? Check us out at whiskeybusinesspod.com, a proud member of the Evergreen Podcast Network. Be sure to subscribe to or follow Gen X Grown Up wherever you listen. And while you're there, rate and review the show, too. It helps more than you know. Nothing like a sandwich. Fresh from the desk drawer. Might I suggest a proper hot lunch with lunch bucket meals? From your microwave to your table, in second, lunch bucket pasta italiano, pasta shells in a zesty meat sauce. Mmm, delicious. What could top this? Perhaps country vegetable soup by the fireside. Lunch bucket meals, a proper hot lunch. Let's get the ball rolling. Talk. We were just saying, I'm not sure if I remember how to do the show after taking a few weeks off. And so far, <laughs> so good. I actually remembered this spiel. So here we go. It is time to get the ball rolling. Talking about media we have been checking out. Now, of course, it could be film or comics or books or music or whatever. And George, I'm very excited to hear what it is that you have been checking out during the hiatus that we weren't together. Yeah, well, I, you know, I picked up on this as soon as we got back from SFGE. I saw mm -hmm. it hit my Plex server while we were at SFGE. I didn't want to try and watch it in the hotel room over the spot hotel wi-fi that you yeah. sometimes have to deal with waited till i got home watched it on uh that monday night actually because we left on monday after the convention it's uh the second season of a tv show from the stars network called heels i don't oh. know if you guys remember oh, yeah. me talking yep. about this previously last year this is the dramatization of what it's like to be in the independent wrestling business uh steven yeah. amell from uh -huh. green lantern uh, or Green Arrow, rather, not Green Lantern. I wish there was a Green Lantern TV <laughs> show, but there hasn't yeah. been. Right. From Green Arrow is the main star of the show. Mm. And it's him and his brother and his wife and some other people around him that have had to take over the wrestling business from his father, who committed suicide in the very first episode of season mm. one. All of season one was all about the drama of how to make it successful and all the personalities and a rival company came into the season about halfway through as you might imagine and then they had their their final series show was them at the state fair you know and putting on this big bonanza show and if it went well then that would save the company and 
of course, everything went crazy in the big show. All this stuff <laughs> happened. And the final scene was the two brothers who were actually really mad at each other. Their characters were mad and hated each other for betrayals and everything else that had gone on during the season. They ended up knocking each other down in the ring and the valet of the younger brother goes up, climbs the ladder and captures the world championship belt for their organization. Mm. So they now have a valet as their world champion because, you know, it's kayfabe and they can't break, you know, character. Uh, this season starts off from that exact moment in episode one, and you see immediately that the younger brother, who is mad at his older brother, especially with all the baggage of the father's suicide and the betrayal of the older brother and all this stuff, he just gets out of the ring, grabs his stuff, gets in his car, and leaves. He is no longer a part of the organization mm. or okay. his family. He is gone. Um, the older brother, Stephen Amell, he is trying to reconcile with his wife and trying to figure out, you know, how to write the next series of shows. The fairgrounds operators are super excited. They sign him to a three year extension to come to the fair all the time because the show was awesome. And that swerve at the end with the ballet capturing the title was so great. I can't believe you wrote that. Of course he didn't. If you're into you can't make that shit up, <laughs> you can't make that shit. Up. I think, as a matter of fact, I think one right. of them had that line. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. I think so. If you're into professional wrestling at all, this is a show that you will probably enjoy because it gives you a feeling for what it might be like on the inside in the know so to speak of the wrestling business it was really well done for its like eight or ten episodes they had last year i really didn't think it was coming back because it took like a year and a half mm -hmm. but okay i see a lot of that yeah they were all just figuring out people's schedules and whatnot to make sure everybody mm -hmm. could come back in the way that they wanted to mm -hmm. they must have filmed and edited all the stuff before the strike that's right going on right now and they were able to get the show on the air and there seems to be uh, a set schedule of like eight or ten episodes for this season that they're going to release on time hmm. so apparently this style of show we've talked about this before with streaming versus appointment mm -hmm. tv and networks and everything you can get a whole season done in between a strike and then release it when the strike's out. And yeah, I think it's what they're doing. Yeah, I right? guess it's okay. So that's where we're at. It's a great show. If you like wrestling, definitely check it out. Yeah. It, what's fascinating is there were several shows like that that you were saying was off for like a year and a half. You don't even know if it's coming back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there were a couple that I've been watching, like uh, Tacoma FD, made by the, oh, the Crooked yeah. Lizard people, the Super right. Trooper people. Mm -hmm. That was off for like almost two years. I'm like, well, that must be dead. And then it's mm -hmm. pulled up. Up a couple of weeks ago, wow. we're really peeking behind the curtain of what the timelines look like in Hollywood, because we know when the cutoff was that there are no writers or actors. Yeah. Right. And now we're seeing stuff. How long must that stuff have been in production yeah. and shot and waiting or just, I guess it could be edited after the strike started, yeah, but not editing, shot but or written it. or anything. Yeah, the know, editors guess, haven't gone on strike yet, mm -hmm. although <laughs> yet. I think it's close. <laughs> right. Oh, yeah. really? I, I, oh, I, yeah, I, I've heard yeah. some rumors that they may go on strike as well. And if they go on strike, yeah, then we're you're down we're to totally reality and game Denmark. shows. That's it. And it's yeah. all repeats. Yeah, good luck. Yeah. Maybe I'll finally watch The Expanse if we run out of other shows, right? <laughs> I know you guys <laughs> love it. Show. I you never got it. to it. You should I know. Totally watch it. I, I was waiting for the strike. Here we are. I, right? I'm kind of happy for the strike. I'm going to catch up on all yeah. these things. i got like 40 episodes of this, 50 episodes of that. Right. I can catch up now. Right. Not for our professionals. We feel for them, but... Right. It, the benefit for us is stop making the new content. We'll let us catch up. Yeah, That's I agree. Well, also. They'll, they'll get benefits out of the strike as well because they all need to get Eventually. paid. This whole thing is about this streaming contract stuff. They yeah. need to get paid for this yeah. content of course, properly. They do. They'll figure it out. And by the time they come back, maybe I've, I'll have caught up on like three of my previous <laughs> TV of the 20 series, series you haven't right. gotten around to. Yeah. Well, John, you got around to something that I, as a movie buff and the guy who runs our rated Gen X channel, I am ashamed to say I do not know what this movie is that mm. you brought oh. to the Trello card. So I'm kind of interested to hear about it. Don't worry about spoilers. I'm perfectly okay with them. So please spoil away with your entry in the media segment. Okay. I got to hear how John explains this movie. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I've seen it. And so I'm yeah. really interested. Again, go 
Go, John. Yeah. Go and go. Yeah. I want to talk about, I saw several films during our hiatus. Uh, There was a lot of stuff in the theater. I saw Barbie. I saw all the stuff that's been out. I saw saw the new Indiana Jones movie, which is so old now. We didn't, none of us picked it to talk about, but (laughs) the film that really, that jumped out at me because I think I wanted to talk about it most because I really liked it. And a lot of my friends really didn't. So uh, it's not even about Bigfoot or puppets. It's totally separate from that. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. Because uh, I went there as soon as you said yeah, my I know you did. Like I, I was just helping you out to save you some time. <laughs> so it's called Asteroid City. This is the latest film by Wes Anderson, who, as you mm. know, is a very hyper-realistic, stylized kind of director. Mm-hmm. This is the same guy that brought us that like super freaky, the Grand Budapest Hotel a few years ago that was shot with models and it was super hyper realistic, like almost like it was a play really. So mm. Asteroid City, the whole premise of Asteroid City is it takes place. This is also a period piece. It takes place around like 1955 in this mm-hmm. little desert town. And at the desert town, there is a gathering of, I guess, kids and students is why they showed up at this desert town. I don't know. Uh, of the junior stargazer space cadet clubs. And it's like a, it's an award ceremony. Like you're getting the reward for okay. most innovative way to look at the stars or most innovative way to test, you know, whatever science experiment you're doing. And all these people show up in this little town and you said spoilers are okay. I only have one spoiler really t- that I'm going to give you because the rest of the story is almost unspoilerable because <laughs> yeah. the experience of the film <laughs> is about the experience, not so much the story being told, but they're all at this little town. And while they're there during an award ceremony, a UFO appears and an alien comes down and takes okay. this little artifact that they have sitting there and so then the entire town gets uh, they take the uh, asteroid right yeah they take the asteroid the right. asteroid city okay. is named after so the that's sitting asteroid there. is the thing of the town okay. yeah and the asteroid is yes. like a softball size right or baseball size basketball yeah. i don't know it's it's about this big like a volleyball that's perfect yeah. for a okay. podcast i'm showing you the size of the ball <laughs> with my hand <laughs> Yeah, the alien takes it for some reason. So now no one's allowed to leave town. Like the military comes in and everything. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Let me talk briefly about who's in this movie. Oh, you said geez. you had not oh, heard of it, George. <laughs> I, I had not. Well, just read a few people that are in it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Brian Cranston, mm-hmm. Edward Norton, Jake Ryan, mm-hmm. Scarlett Johansson, Maya Hawk, Jeffrey Wright, Steve Park, Lee Schreiber, Matt Dillon. Tom okay. Hanks. Tom Hanks is in here. I mean, everybody, basically, Steve Carell is in here. Mm-hmm. Jeff Goldblum. I mean, everybody. It's basically like Wes Anderson calls somebody and go, hey, I'm doing a yes. Just tell me what it is and where to be there. Like yeah. nobody says no to Wes Anderson, it seems. I've had that impression from his films before. They don't mm-hmm. seem to be a lot of unknown B-level yeah. actor yep. people no, no, kind no, of thing. It's always big celebrities that you're like, how the hell did he get them in this? It's, <laughs> yep. uh, he got these, A lot of these big celebrities have small parts. Smaller like, parts. Really yeah, small parts. All. Like you see them in a couple scenes and that's it. And they're gone. Yep. It, well, it maybe that's amazing. part of the appeal. Like he calls them and says, listen, I've got one day's worth of work for you. One come day's on work. Out. Do you want to come out? Yeah, yeah. You, you're right. You get airfare, you get a hotel, bring your wife. Who knows, right? Well, one of those I, I of think things. also because in this movie specifically, all the characters are so unusual and unique. And I'm sure as an actor, it's probably great to play these kinds of roles, I would think. Yeah. Well, to that end, Mo. So I've talked about the premise and I've talked mm-hmm. about all the talent. The movie itself is structured like, like a chambered Nautilus or like a Russian nesting doll because you're not just watching the movie. And I'm not sure what I was watching the whole time. <laughs> I think there was a play. I'm almost positive there was a play. There was also a guy presenting the play. And then the play we see on a stage sometimes and then sometimes it's in the real world at this town that itself looks like a stage play because it has these hmm. hyper bright right. props and set pieces and like like they built this town on a sound stage but because of the nature of the surrealism of the movie they just let it look like a sound stage that had props and a fake town on it but it's all told as if it's real and you're never really sure if you're seeing the story as it really happened or am I seeing the stage production about the story as it really happened or am I seeing the guys talk about putting on the stage production as it happened <laughs> or am I seeing the guys behind stage who are waiting to go on for their part in the stage production it's so layered and it's so interesting I said 
that in the middle of this film and I thought to myself, man, I could watch one of these movies every week. It was so interesting. And I love live theater. So it's it's that inception kind of what's really happening. What am I really looking at? What part is really real? And then in the end, you're left with a kind of a, it isn't so much what a satisfying story, though the story does have a conclusion. It's more like what a performance piece I just saw for a bunch of amazing actors in a non-typical, we're all sick of seeing people repeat themselves in Hollywood. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. the same shit over and over again. This wasn't that. This was something really unique and kind of special. Very Wes Anderson-y. It looks like his stuff, but it's not just a rinse and repeat. Now, yeah. you hadn't heard of it, George. Mo, I know you mm. saw it. Yep. Are you in the camp of people thought it was dumb or did you like it a little or? I, I'm not sure. I mean, honestly, I, I, see, I have to answer not sure because I watched fair. it. I, yeah. I watched the entire thing. I paid attention to the entire thing. Like it kept my mm-hmm. attention the entire time, but my head kept going like, what the hell is going on? I mean, that's what kept going mm. through my head. Like, what? where's the story going? Like, I wasn't sure. Like, I wasn't sure where it was going. Like, where where was it leading me? What was it trying to get to? Or you know, I wasn't sure about that. Every performance was amazing. I mean, every single freaking mm-hmm. performance. Yep. The kids yep. were amazing in this. They, the kid the little kids were, are awesome. Yeah, They were yep. awesome in this. It kept surprising me. Every time I turned a scene, I'm like, Jeff Goldblum. You know I mean? It was like, you <laughs> What's know, he doing here? Tilda <laughs> Swinson. I mean, I was like, I mean, just, yep. just, like they just keep a scene coming. and they're gone. I liked the, that it was, it was very different. I mean, this is the way they put it. It's, it was a very different kind of movie. Definitely not a typical, you're never sure you're watching a movie, quite honestly. I mean, I, I, that's yep, like, that's you're right. trying to describe it. You're, you're watching something and I, I enjoyed the experience, but I'm not sure I liked like that. The it movie. didn't really <laughs> get me somewhere. You know what I mean? Like I didn't feel like yeah. it took me somewhere necessarily. So it's, I'm actually going to watch it again. Cause I think I it's a fair it criticism. Twice. Like I said, it's, I'm never really sure the movie was a movie or a story. Yeah. There was a story that loosely held it together. That's fair. I, having not seen it myself, I just have a question and I'm kind of basing this off of another movie that I fell in love with, uh, when was that last year? I think it was that it came out called the menu. Mm-hmm. You guys mm-hmm. remember that's the one oh, where certainly. rich people go to the yep. restaurant on the Island and all the crazy yep. stuff. happens. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's a movie that when I saw it in the theater, I was mesmerized. I was fascinated to the description that you guys gave. I wasn't a hundred percent sure what I was watching at all times. Mm-hmm. I have now watched that movie three times since I saw it in the theater mm, Okay, and I still enjoy it, even though I know everything that's going to happen and I've had time to analyze it and think mm-hmm. about it and everything. I'm still enjoying rewatching the movie and getting little nuances mm-hmm. out of it that I didn't pick up on a previous viewing. I'm wondering if this movie, if a, since I see from a descriptor in the card that it looks like it came out in June, mm-hmm. possibly if you've mm-hmm. had an opportunity to see it multiple times since, and if so, do you feel like that it's still entertaining or is it one of those things that you really should only watch it once to get the mm. most enjoyment out of it? Because a second viewing might spoil, mm-hmm. you know, the, what you experienced the first time. I have watched it a second time uh, now that I have it available for but via streaming. And I can tell you that it's not at all like the menu where at the menu, you always were in the same, you were present no, in the I, same moment, but you were I'm not confused what was, sure what was happening. But like the menu, I think Asteroid City, there's so much to pick up in the nuanced performances and picking mm-hmm. up on how you're leaping from how deep you are into the the performances. Uh, there's definitely more to see on a subsequent viewing. And I picked up a couple things on the second viewing that I didn't. So I guess I'll say, okay. if you like it the first time, it warrants more viewings. If you hated it, gotcha. you probably won't get anything new out of it <laughs> in subsequent viewing. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, it's just like, not Kind of like uh, Marcus with Midsummer. Like, he'll never Actually, watch that think, film. I think Marcus time. hated this movie too, so. Did he really? <laughs> yeah, I think he did. I'm, I'm beginning he? to question Marcus's movie well, he, <laughs> reading <mean, beginning>. system. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that's my, my media pick. So Mo, what about you? You also picked up on one of the, actually yeah. one of the big blockbusters you oh, just yeah. hit the theaters. Um, I, yeah, I was really looking forward to this. I seeing Oppenheimer. Mm-hmm. Ah, Christopher Nolan. Atomic bomb. I, yeah. I, like 99% of everything he's ever done. All the actors in it I loved. The story itself I was really super interested in too. I mean, just the whole thing. And, you know, it's a long movie. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's a long movie. It's like almost three hours. I think right at three. Right at three. Oh, wow. Okay. In my opinion, it was probably a half hour too long. Um, Okay. And... And some of the story, uh, honestly, I mean, I, I enjoyed the movie. I'm not in the camp of saying it was like the best movie ever in the world. Like it's got like 90 something percent on Rotten Tomatoes mm-hmm. and all that stuff. I'm not in that camp either. You know, I thought it was a really good movie. I don't know if I will see it again anytime soon mm-hmm. because it, okay. was a, it was it was a heavy movie. But the performances in it, everybody who's in it just did a, a freaking amazing, amazing job. 
and the story, I mean, I think they really captured the the stress that these scientists were under to develop the bomb ahead of mm-hmm. Germany. You, I mean, I, you felt that tension when they were actually going to light the actually drop the test bomb. The stress level was just was up <laughs> to like a thousand. You know, I mean, they did such an amazing job of that. But then there was a side story that was to me was like a little. It was weird. It was like a whole trial, and they did a lot of time jumping too in this movie. So I don't know if I loved it, loved it like everybody else. So I know John, you saw it though, right? I did. I did. And uh, I'll just go on record and say I did not enjoy watching this movie. Okay. I enjoyed seeing the movie. I enjoyed having had seen it, but it, it was work to watch. Yeah, it was. Because of the jumping around. Because And and I know this is Christopher Nolan, and I know he wanted to tell a larger story. I imagined, if, if I was going to storyboard this, I'm like, well, we meet the guy, we do the things, mm-hmm. blah, blah, blah. And toward the end of the movie, the bomb drops. The bomb drops at the halfway point of the movie. Yeah. And there's another hour and a half of the political maneuverings and backstabbing and stuff that's going on around it. it. Yeah. Yeah. And so you have to really be an American history buff, a world history buff. Uh, You're right. The performances were great. Robert Downey Jr. For a guy who has more money than God and could have just phoned in a performance. He was the best performance in the the film, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, he was amazing. Better than any of the star. I mean, he's a star, but better than the headliners. It just wasn't. It's like Saving Private Ryan. Like, I like what I learned from it. I enjoyed the performances, but I never need to watch that movie again because it's work, it's effort, it's heartbreaking, it's breathtaking. Mm -hmm. There's so much to it. And Oppenheimer was like that for me. I understand the artistry, a lot of stuff there. I don't think I ever need or want to see it again unless somebody tells me something crazy I missed, you know? I mean, I haven't seen it yet. I know both Mm -hmm. of you have, obviously, Mm -hmm. and that's why we're talking about it. Killian Murphy or Cillian Murphy, however you say his name. Mm -hmm. I've loved that guy ever since 28 Days Later. That's where I first found him. Mm -hmm. Emily Blunt, I know, is in it. Yeah. You guys already mentioned Damon and Downey. Florence Pugh, who mm-hmm. was in Midsummer, yeah. that we were just talking mm-hmm. about That's a second right. ago. Uh, and wasn't she like the Black Widow's sister yeah, or sister. something? Yep. Isn't that the same she girl? Is yeah, in the Marvel okay. stuff. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Josh Hartnett's in there. Casey Affleck, oh, yeah. who has turned into a phenomenal yeah. actor and director. Rami Malek, who we've all yep. loved from the Queen movie and everything else. Um, I mean, goes on and on. Kenneth Branagh, for crying oh, out loud. There's another one. Everybody was in it. Yeah. Yeah. It, I, <laughs> I know that you say it's work. I and mm-hmm. I get where you were talking about if I storyboarded it out, the bomb would have dropped at the end. Personally, not having seen it yet, not knowing the work that it is to watch it, I wanted this subject matter to be work because mm-hmm. it is arguably okay. the most important story oh, yeah. ever told Absolutely. in human history because it is the thing that affects more human lives than is ever possible because it's the development mm-hmm, mm-hmm. of the nuclear bomb and yeah. all of that that entails. I don't mind if the bomb gets dropped halfway through, as you said, because I really want to see the bookends around the event. Mm-hmm. Oh, you I do. want to know <laughs> you definitely all do. the behind stuff beforehand yeah. and after. I'm perfectly happy if I know going in that it's a long movie mm-hmm. and if it's a Christopher Nolan thing mm-hmm. who we all know yeah. You know, is going to do some crazy shit, right? Yeah, pay attention. Um, yeah, just, sure. yeah, some deep, hard stuff. I'm perfectly okay with that. I didn't see this one as a summer blockbuster. I know you use that term mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. when you introduced Mo into the segment. I saw this one as kind of one of those that's that has the potential. I'm not saying it is because I haven't seen it yet, but has the potential to become like a classic later on. So like a, a streetcar named Desire type of thing mm-hmm. or, you know, Dr. Zhivago mm-hmm. maybe or something along those lines that is just a piece of American cinema because of its storytelling ability. Did it tell the story oh, yeah. solidly? Is oh, 100%. Oh, yeah. A thousand yeah. percent. Yeah. Okay. Did. Yeah. Absolutely. So if it did that, then I'm on board. Yeah. Yeah. And, and one caveat I'll say to make sure I didn't mis- misrepresent is that I don't want the time back. It's not like I put in the work and I'm like, oh, that was a waste <laughs> of my time. It was, it was entertaining and it was informational and there was emotion. All that was there. But it wasn't like, a, oh, let's just hit popcorn and see how this goes. No, you got to pay attention. You got to be into it. Uh, you, you can't half watch this. You, don't watch this while you're right. doom scrolling on your phone. Right. You, know? <laughs> you need to pay attention because you will not get the film, right? It's, it's, it's not that kind of, it's not going to hold your hand. You yeah. got to be there in the moment. Oh, absolutely. And I'd say one thing um, that the one biggest criticism I've heard about this movie, a lot of people said is that they didn't show things from the perspective of like what it did in Japan when they dropped the bomb yeah like they don't show they don't show much but i actually don't have a problem with that because the movie was from the perspective of the scientists who didn't see that mm-hmm. 
Mm. Like it's mentioned, it's, it's but mentioned. it doesn't. They, they like, did, yeah, they didn't ignore yeah. it, but it was there. Yeah. But they didn't like spend a whole lot, ton of time on it. You didn't see Hiroshima or Nagasaki. They didn't show pictures of that at mm. all, actually. Right. You hear it happens on the radio. Yeah, you hear it on the radio. <laughs> but again, it's right. like this is from perspective of scientists who are in freaking uh, New Mexico somewhere. It's a fair criticism, but American films are always going to have an American centric viewpoint. That's, you know, just the way it's going to be. Like if you get a film out of Bollywood, they're not going to tell you about what it's like to drive up and down Panama City Beach cruising for chicks. It's Bollywood, right? It's Mm -hmm. it's going to be something based in India. I get that. But I mean, at some point, you know, maybe make a second film like uh, like Eastwood did with the two uh, Flags of Our Fathers and uh, Sons of Iwo Jima films sure knowing you as i do george being a film buff you will enjoy seeing this film i will be curious to see what you think about your predicted longevity and its legacy that i'm very curious to see what you think and i i'm not worried about you liking it i'm worried what you think about what people will think about it in the future as you suggested so we'll all stay tuned to see what you think yeah coming up on five minute news i'm anthony davis You might think it's partisan because maybe it's critical of one side or the other, but it's not. It's just the truth. And I think that's also something that's kind of unusual for Americans listening to the radio or to podcasts because the news landscape in the States has been so partisan for so many decades. So 5-Minute News is verified, truthful, independent, unbiased and essential world news daily. You're listening to Gen X Grown Up. But if you have a friend who's not yet listening, why not? Tell them about us. They'll thank you later. When a road is slippery, braking your car can cause skidding or worse. Now, Tevis, an ITT company, has an anti-lock brake system to help keep your car under control. A built-in computer senses the road and brakes the wheels without locking. This ITT Tevis system is available on some American cars now, and none too soon. I'm going to kick off Tech and Toys with something I got as a little gift uh, recently. It's a company called uh, Metal Earth, and they oh, make yeah, yeah they make mm-hmm. these little metal fold them mm-hmm. up models. So think of it like yep. a paper model except metal. <laughs> you know, I've still got an Iron Man that's half finished. I've got yeah. it up to his knees. <laughs> that's as far as I've gotten. Oh yeah, let me tell you. And I, I built, I had a Millennium Falcon one before. Um, so now I got a uh, Pose X-Wing fighter is the new one I got. Oh. And that's so much I want to talk about the model itself. I just want to warn people who get these. If you like model building, they're really fun. They're really good. But if you're like my age, get a magnifying device of some sort. Mm-hmm. <laughs> get a couple of things of needle those pliers because there's no way yeah, your fingers yep. are going to be able to manipulate these things. <laughs> and lots of light. Just yes. going to say that. <laughs> but if you have all that, because when I did the Millennium Falcon one, I didn't have all that. And it was torture at sometimes to get these things to fit together or to hold the little pieces <laughs> mm-hmm. together. So this one, I, I did it smarter. <laughs> I made sure I had like my magnifying system set up. I was able to see all the pieces. It went together a lot smoother. And let me tell you though, they look really cool when you're done. They do. They when do. they get finished. Yeah, once they're finished, I mean, yeah. Iron Man shins kick ass. Trust me. <laughs> Just imagine. You know, your description of when you set up and prep to build this thing, mm-hmm. Mo, is like how I set up and prep to build anything Lego ever. Yeah. Mm. So too much light. Yep. Reading glasses on, hunched over. Looking. <laughs> now I have at least I have the app for Lego, so I can use that. Right. Trying to read trying those to read instructions. But, yeah. But yeah, it's there's something about in my day. Yeah. Just as a kid, <laughs> you could sit in the freaking dark and put Legos together and see everything you need to see, and everything <laughs> yeah. is great. But now, like your range of focus is such that we have to do extra work to enjoy something that young people take for granted. I took for granted when I was a kid. Oh, absolutely. Mm-hmm. And if this fine print on something, oh, I'm screwed. Forget it. Yeah. Forget it. <laughs> <laughs> I was just curious, Mo, how long or how many sessions maybe is the better question. Did it take you to mm. finish this thing? And how big was it when you finished? Because some of these Metal Earth things are just a few inches. Yeah, and some is. of them I've seen are like almost like half a foot or yeah. even a foot in some yeah, cases. This, this is a small one. This is It's only about maybe two and a half, three inches long when you're okay. done. Okay. No wonder you needed glasses. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, exactly. Right. There's some, there are some small details in that too. And you're having to fold things. Like I said, my fingers are just not that dexterous anymore. Mm. 
Um, but mm-hmm. and uh, it took me like two and a half sessions. Like it took me a couple hours to put it together. Mm. So like about an hour at a time, and yeah. then you're like, "Fuck this! I gotta yeah, walk away." Tired. I got a, I got a headache. I got a pee. <laughs> Everything was wrong yeah. with me. I'm like, I'm gonna. That's go why get I a have beer. to have a whole room because my wife won't let me keep that stuff out on the dining room table. But I'm like, <laughs> listen, halfway. this is yeah. gonna take a month and a half for me to finish. <laughs> I, need, I need a stable place. I mean, they're good for our age. They're also, I mean, they're very cool if you have younger people as well because mm-hmm. they'll build it easier and faster and make you look bad but they all come out <laughs> looking really good and they have a whole wide range they said that middle earth they, they just come out with just tons and tons and tons of these models and they got a lot of every, licenses they have a yeah. lot of ip that they have all sorts of and they're all super right. super cool so and they're cheap too that's the two they're like mm-hmm. 10 bucks 12 bucks they're a couple sheets of of, of yeah. rigid metal they're not very yeah, it's, thick it's right aluminum but, that's been punched and they have out. a big die punch a chunk yep. and then they yep. sell them for 10 bucks so good yeah. for them so you know but they said nice nice little side gifts mm-hmm. to get somebody so that's what i got so how about you john what you got for us today uh, so you might remember i think it was the last time we spoke on the regular show i was talking about uh and george was salivating about the tron gadget that i found oh right? yeah <laughs> yes that was nice <laughs> So to re- refresh your memory very briefly, it was made by Tomy, their division called Tomy Tronic. And it was it's an, a VFD, which is a vacuum fluorescent display or something. I think it's called. Somebody will tell me if I got that wrong. So it's not quite an LCD. It's much brighter. and it, But it's limited, right? It's from the 80s. I think that mm-hmm. one was 81. Uh, actually came out 82. Ever since I found that and another one with it, it's really got me on a kick of like, man, I missed out on a whole swath of gaming stuff. And it's these handheld things. Of course, everybody knows the, what, the Mattel football and... Simon and Merlin and stuff like that. But a bunch of these I'd never seen before. And so when I started posting videos about the ones that I'd recently found, including that Tron, many of our viewers started chiming in going, if you like that, you got to look for this one and this one and this one. And one of the ones they mentioned was Tommy Tronic also did a version of Scramble, the arcade game. So I went poking around and lo and behold, I found one on eBay. The guy was virtually giving it away. I lowballed him and he's like, fine. <laughs> Sealed though, still in the shrink wrap. Wow. Yeah. From 1982. Mm. Now, wow. I did a video on this. Uh, and I'll put a link to it, Mo. You yeah, can put it down absolutely. the show notes if you would. But I want to talk about it very briefly because it's the latest little toy or gadget that I've picked up I, more since then. But it's the latest one I picked up that I'm really enamored with. First, the experience of opening something that some human sealed in a box <laughs> back in 1982 and has since forth been bouncing around the planet, nobody touching it for decades, like it was waiting for me, right? So, <laughs> and, and, and I don't leave my toys in the box, right? So I'm, I did the video. I cut the shrink wrap. I opened it the first time. Oh, you, somebody was screaming, though. And, right. They're screaming. Like, I don't <laughs> care. That's how like, I do ah! it. Right? Somebody's like, you can't possibly. <laughs> but usually when I review these things, the first thing I do is like, what condition is the screen in? Any scratches? Didn't have to ask. No one's touched it. Yeah. What about wow. the battery box? Any corrosion? It's never had a battery in it, right? It's mm. It was it was like I walked out of service merchandise. Like I walked in, I watched <laughs> it come up the conveyor belt. Oh, it's mine. And you picked it up and I walked in and opened it 40 years later on video. Wow. That experience was amazing. And I share that in the video. So you can check that out. What's further amazing is think about Scramble, the arcade game. Remember mm-hmm. we talked about Tron and they were actually able to sure. get in like the light cycles and the discs of Tron and right. fighting the MCP on this fixed screen. So think about Scramble. What are the different levels? Well, you have just kind of flying over the like the terrain level and then you have yeah, side scrolling kind of yes, stuff. Yes, yeah. side scrolling thing. Then you have the one where you're inside of the base and you have to, you're up and down through these oh, right. narrow yeah. lines. Crash up too, right? Yeah. And sometimes there's meteors flying at you. Sometimes mm-hmm. there's UFOs shooting at you. That's all there. There's like six different levels in this thing that they're able okay. to squeeze out of a carefully planned VFD. I can't believe I missed these. I only really paid attention to like the Coleco, Donkey Kong, and Frogger and those kinds of things, which were fine. They didn't have near the ingenuity. Uh, Mo, one thing you and I have talked about a lot is old games are cool. Part of what makes them cool is seeing how people absolutely force their will yeah. upon limited technology to make it do something right. you really shouldn't be able to do. And the clever planning, the way this works, you know, you look at the VFD cells and there's like, well, there's an outline for that could be your ship or that could be an alien or that could be a meteor. If you light up these two, mm. it looks like a UFO. Or you light up these two, and it looks like a rocket. And that way, you can have anything on the screen, even though you don't have discrete pixels. Genius the way it's done. Take a look at the video, and you'll see. Yeah, I don't know if you guys ever had any of these handheld or tabletop toys like that as kids. Beyond like the football, have you experienced them much? Not that much for me, actually. And I'm friends yeah. had them, but not me. Uh uh-huh. Yeah, personally. Yeah. I'm, uh, for us, it was I think a little bit of what Mo's talking about. The friends. Uh, all of the parents in my childhood neighborhood subscribe to neighborhood purchasing power rules. So <laughs> if one kid in the neighborhood bought it, none of yep. the other parents were forced to. So you could all share. Uh, and yep. they, 
they definitely made sure like there was the star wars kids house who had mm-hmm. all the little figures and there was mm-hmm. the sports house that was mine that had mm-hmm. baseball and football and whatever else we wanted to play with all the equipment but i did get a star wars tabletop thing but it's not nearly in the vein of the stuff that you're showing on this video or mm-hmm. that you've talked about in previous uh, videos. The Star Wars thing, it's literally just a bunch of red dots. And right. it's it's almost like Battleship kind of in the gotcha. Star Wars oh, theme. Okay. And then I had, uh, I had a Merlin. That mm, was sure. probably the next closest thing I got. But other than... The little football ones, those were, and you know, arguably I probably bugged my parents a lot more for like electronic baseball or football than I mm-hmm. would have yeah. these arcade machines. Yeah. Well, it's something I certainly missed out on the first time around. I didn't know what was available. I just, I thought they were all the same as like the Coleco tabletops. And I'm like, they're fine, but they're really, there are other manufacturers doing other really interesting things back then. And I'm half of me's mad that I missed it. But then <laughs> like Firefly, where I was a few episodes I won't watch part of me is like i can still discover all these now sadly they're pretty expensive these days you got to keep your eye open for deals but when you run across them keep your eye open watch the videos you guys probably already have but yep. it's really amazing what they've done so listener if you haven't seen this you will be stunned if you've not seen these before go check out the video that mo links you to to my tommy scramble it's pretty pretty neat pretty damn it's neat. very cool george how about you what have you been checking out in tech and toys my friend well uh so you know we talked about it a lot at the beginning of the podcast sfge is a mm-hmm. windfall for a lot of different reasons right it's it's fun it's relaxing for us it's the only convention that i think in the what how long have we been doing this now eight years i think you told me seven or eight something seven, like that seven, right in there eight, i think uh, yeah something around that area yeah it's the only convention <laughs> that we have i think all agreed upon that is our entertainment fun convention for the three of us yeah mm-hmm. one of the things that they do at this convention that we've discovered over the last couple of trips is they they tend to have what they call flea markets yep Last year, the flea market that I attended was strictly about gaming stuff, and it was in the back corner of the arcade area, and it was literally Hmm. just, you know, a bunch of folding tables, and people had their flea market type of junk up there, but I found, like, some Atari 2600 cartridges Mm -hmm. and a Galaga marquee and things like that this year. I went back specifically knowing that there was going to be another one of those, but they also on a different day in a different location did a tabletop board game flea market. Oh, right. I missed that. So I, yeah, I picked up like four or five games at that for Mm. under $25 total. Wow. Really fun little stuff. I picked up a Munchkin, which was a Marvel version of Munchkin. I picked (laughs) up another thing that was called Sloth Ninjas. I am dying to figure out how those two (laughs) words go together in a game. So I grabbed those, right? Exactly. John's doing the the sloth slow ninja motion, motion karate slow hands. Motion yeah. karate. Uh, but I did also go back to that arcade style flea market that they did. And I happened upon a table. Uh, there was one table where a guy had like 10 or 15 Atari 2600 cartridges. He wanted like 25 bucks. And there were several duplicates. I'm like, eh, mm-hmm. no boxes, no nothing, okay. just the cartridges. None of them looked super special, and I'm like, okay, no, I can't, I can't do that. Under that, <laughs> yeah. he had a box of Intellivision. Now, this one had nice Intellivision boxes. Uh, I didn't open up any of the boxes to see if they had the little covers for the arcade sticks for the Intellivision mm-hmm. or the oh, cartridges right. or manuals or whatever. Right. But the boxes looked nice. Uh, he probably had thirty or forty of them. One is seventy five dollars for the box. Ooh, the whole like, box. That's I'm not like, awful. Ah, it's not awful, but eh, it's still you know, bucks. it's it doesn't feel like a flea market price, right? <laughs> okay, uh, all right. I mean, granted, it's at a convention, so you got convention pricing versus flea market pricing. I get all of that, but I talked with the showrunners, and I don't think they charge those people anything oh, for those really? tables. Not for the flea market. I think you're right. No. Yeah. Now I went down a little bit further, and I went past all the arcade game PCBs and you know, the pinball controls and plungers and everything else that were on a billion tables there. And I found a guy, John, to your Konomi stuff there that you were talking about with the Tomy, you know, all Mm -hmm. those handheld tabletops. I found a guy who had seven, I believe it was seven or eight of the more modern, my arcade versions of this thing. The micro players. Yeah. Yeah. The ones that are from my arcade though, that were like the $20 ones in Walmart. So they had Mm -hmm. the Galaga, 
He had the karate champ. He had the burger time. Perfect. Yep. All of those that are, we talked about in one of our panels at the convention. Yep. Uh, they're very difficult to find now. You can't really mm-hmm. see them in stores because they, they sold them out and didn't replenish the stock during COVID and whatnot. That's right. And that company's not really doing those anymore. They've moved in a different direction. But I got the entire set. Now, like I said, it was seven or eight of them. Normally, they'd be 20 to $30 in today's market. That's right. I got all seven or eight of them for 100 bucks. Wow. That's okay. pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. 12 bucks each, more or less. Yeah, that's not bad. Yeah. They were all in the box, looked unopened. So I'm like, okay, I'll take a chance. I might open <laughs> them up and they've been used and they put back in the box and the battery boxes might be awful or something, but who cares? <laughs> I now have that shelf candy display that you were talking about in our panel. Unfortunately, though, hearing you talk about Tommy, (laughs) now I want to go buy those. So (laughs) it's it's a slippery slope, but it's one that's fun to be on. So that that is a really good deal. That's basically half price or better, maybe depending on how rare they are. Because they went between twenty to twenty five. Like you said, thirty thirty five. Now, if you try to buy them on Amazon because they're low, they're deplenished. They're 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 deplenished. They're they're deplenished. Depleted stock, you can't find depleted. it. Depleted, well. right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, SFGE is just one of the rare conventions that you can go and play arcade games, go and play board games, see great panels, hear mm-hmm. great people talk about stuff they're experts in, and also pick up stuff that you love for very affordable prices. Yep. And in some cases, win them for free. They have all kinds. Co- it's oh, so yeah. many yeah. opportunities to find great stuff there. Yeah. Yeah, that was a good find. Well, speaking of which. When we get back from this next break, I think, if I'm not wrong, our entire game segment is full of games that we got at SFG. Yeah. <laughs> so it does appear that so way. So the Southern Rock Gaming Expo party train has not yet pulled into the station. There's more <laughs> coming. <laughs> Stick around. Are you tired of seeing your teen or young adult struggle on a path that clearly isn't the right fit? Is your teenager confused about which direction to take after high school? The future of work is changing rapidly. And our kids need to know all of the options available after high school so they're empowered to make the choice that is best for them. In each episode, we explore the latest trends that are shaping the opportunities of today and tomorrow. I'm your host, Betsy Jewell, and this is the High School Hamster Wheel Podcast. Each episode of Gen X Grown Up has show notes loaded with links where you can learn more about our topics. And there's even more to see and hear over at GenXGrownUp.com. Which cereal has more vitamin nutrition than any other? Kellogg's Product 19 cereal. But you'd never guess. Oh. Because Product 19 vitamins are flaky, bumpy, crispy, crunchy, and taste so good. Product 19 goodness comes from corn, oats, wheat, and rice. Delicious. Kellogg's Product 19. Flaky, bumpy, crispy, crunchy. Mmm. Tasty vitamins. This is the main event of the podcast for the three in attendance locally and the millions listening around the world. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time! Gentlemen, more often than not, when we get to the game segment, two-thirds, if not all three parts of this segment are about video games in some form or fashion. Generally, yeah, yeah. usually. A lot usually. of times. Yep. However, as John <laughs> mentioned at the end of the previous segment, today, everything is about board games. Yeah. Yep. And they absolutely 100% qualify. There's no question that SFGE is like a discovery zone for all three of us for new games that we oh, find yeah. interesting. It's a great place to play the games because they have so many places that you can play and try out the games for free before That's you right. buy them with your family and friends, which is awesome. Yeah. That is one of the best parts. Absolutely. That's how they get you. It gets me every year. Right. <laughs> exactly. I want to start with Mo because yeah. Mo picked up a game that is from a company that he and I both bought two games last from year. last SFG. <laughs> yeah, and Mo we went ahead and bought a third, third this one. year. Yeah. yeah, we did. It's a game called Quali. Uh, Quali. A, a, a qu- a koale, I guess that's how I'm not sure exactly how to pronounce it. I, I never know how to pronounce yeah. any of their names, and half of them start with the letter Q. Q. Yes, right. Q-A-W-A-L-E. It's a Q with no U, so your guess is as good as ours. Yeah. Let's go with Kale, whatever. whatever. Like. <laughs> but anyway, it's um, it's a company called uh, Gigamic, and yep. they make the like, super high quality just games. When you play them, they just feel good mm-hmm. in your hands to play with because the pieces are solid and they're heavy and they're wood. Yes. 
polished wood, beautiful polished wood pieces, and you know yeah. the boards are nice, and everything feels really good. This particular game, and like all of their games, are all like very simple rules. But mm-hmm. when you play it, there's just a ton of strategy when you start getting into it. Surprise, kind of like the hallmark, right? Easy yeah. to learn, difficult to master. There you yeah. go. Yeah. Like take Othello and just make it cooler. And so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so this particular game, it's all about stacking stones. And again, I'm not gonna go through the whole details, but essentially your goal is to get four stones in a row. And how you do it is that you move, you stack them, and then you can move the entire stack around the board. And it's a four by four Ooh. board. And when you move it, you have to leave a stone behind from the bottom of the pile, essentially. And then ah, you leave it until you okay. get to the top stone, and then that goes in that last mm-hmm. spot. Yep. So think about it that, you know, so you get stones eventually stacked with different color stones in between. And as you're moving around the board, you're trying to make sure you place that particular color. Because if it's not your color, you could be helping your opponent. Mm-hmm. And you got to oh. think three or four moves ahead. You got to, I mean, the first time you play it, you're like, oh, it's a simple game. You play the first time, you lose, <laughs> like I did. And but then also you're like, oh, wait a minute. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, now, like your brain starts thinking like, oh, I got to start thinking about not now, mm-hmm. but two steps from now. Like I got to get these stones, this stack set up in a way that I can move it and make, you know, four in a row. Right. I just love these games and they're quick to play. That's the other thing yeah, I like right? about it. You could knock out a game in 10 minutes, maybe 15 tops. You know, yeah. 15 if you're really thinking hard, which is, you know. Cause that you game in particular, you each have eight little stones and yeah. you take eight turns and that's yeah. it. That's it. If nobody wins, it's a draw, but, yeah, but there's that- the board's so claustrophobic, the odds are somebody's going to win because at that <laughs> yeah. point you have 20 some odd stones stacked up everywhere. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you, you, you can make over. the other guy win by accident if you're not careful. You got to really pay attention. Yeah, that's actually yeah. what I did the first time. <laughs> that kind of happens in those games, right? Like it's it's like, oh, we're playing, we're playing. Oh shit, you won two moves ago. What happened? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. I, in, in these Gigamic games, it always kind of seems, yeah. at least for the first two plays, maybe, and then you have that aha, yeah. and you start to <laughs> understand how to play. But mm-hmm. I'll be honest, if I saw these games in their stark white boxes mm-hmm. on a shelf in a gaming store environment i don't think i'd pick them up they are not the traditional big bold colored graphic no, kind subtle. of things that you yeah. might see with like a munchkin or a smash up or low key any you know a ticket yeah. to ride mm-hmm. any of that kind of stuff they're very low key and even mm-hmm. the font is very stark that they use on exactly. it exactly yeah, like right super thin little yeah, yeah like but wh- you get an opportunity at this convention to play this game put yeah. your hands on the pieces oh, as so Mo was talking in. about that, yeah that's what happens and the thing is that you played a couple times and just when you think like oh i'm starting to get the game you know oh it's time to move on to something else and game so now it's like now i gotta buy it because the only way i'm gonna do this now is when i go <laughs> right home. so i have to take buy a freaking copy of it so the thing is with these these games are not inexpensive though these are not inexpensive board games this particular one i think mm-hmm. on amazon now you get for like 38 bucks thereabouts right mm. yep they're games that i think that my kids will be grabbing from after i'm dead they're gonna go in the house and they're gonna be taking <laughs> these games they'll leave the monopoly set behind but they'll right. take these because these Who are gets cool. who's gonna get that one yeah, oh, we're exactly. gonna fight over it. yeah <laughs> yeah these are not boards that are gonna fall fall apart on yeah. you no, in a year's no, time permanent. like a cheap monopoly board or scrabble or something yeah. these are handcrafted quality pieces they're probably not handcrafted but, but they, they look good they feel that way yeah, yeah. i'll tell you yep. even having one of these if i had this set up like on a small table in my living room it would look cool it would mm-hmm. yeah you like know? a 3d chess set on the enterprise yeah. right it looks cool sitting there it just, looks cool just sitting there <laughs> yeah people yeah. are gonna ask about it and say what the hell is this and then you yeah. get to introduce them to the game yeah. allow me to whip your ass yes exactly <laughs> exactly <laughs> <laughs> so, so actually, John, I actually got the game that John bought too that he's about to talk about. Okay. Oh, we sold a bunch of these. Yeah. yeah. Also at SFGE. Yeah. Yeah. They sold out before I got mine. Oh, they were running out? like crazy. Yeah. Oh, oh man. So, is another one of those rooms where you can go in and just play as much as you want of something. They won't run you mm-hmm. off. You go in and sit and play. And when I first saw this game, I was just walking around casually and I saw a grown man sitting across from like a (laughs) seven-year-old little girl and they were just hand, chin on their fists, just studying the board. And I watched this little girl <laughs> move this little piece very carefully and move something over. I'm like, what is going on here? This grown man and this little girl are both into this so heavily. And then I saw what it was. They're moving cute little wooden cats. 
<laughs> little kittens and cats around the board. The game is called Boop. Isn't it adorable? B-O-O-P, <laughs> period. Boop. Like you'd boop a kitty on the nose. This is another one of those, the manufacturer of the game sold it to me because you look at it and you're like, I can make that with two different color checkers and be done. I don't need yeah, all of this. Right. But here's how they get you. First, it's a game about cats. It's You have eight little kittens and eight little grown cats. You both have that. The play board, oh God, the play field, <laughs> it's not a board. It's not handcrafted lumber or anything. It's a little eight by eight kitty cat quilt. <laughs> And right. it's actually a soft little quilt. So what you have is this cat bed and you're playing your little cats. And the boop concept comes in when you <laughs> set down a cat. If another cat sits down <laughs> next to the cat, it boops that cat and shoves him over a space or diagonal space or whatever. Right. If you get three little kittens in a row, you turn them into cats. The goal of the game is to get three grown cats in a row. And as you might imagine, cats can boop kittens, but kittens can't boop cats because the cats are yeah, bigger. Of and Look, I don't need to read you the whole <laughs> rules. The bottom line is it's cute as hell. Yeah. It's fun and easy, like a 10 minute game, like we were talking about, easy to do. And it's so charming of our group as we're standing around playing. So we had a friend there and his daughter was like, oh, I'm dying to buy this. And I'm like, yeah, I don't know if I will, but here, like Kat and I were there. We chipped in 20 bucks a piece. You go buy it. Just go ahead. So that was one. And then I played a couple more times like, well, now I'm buying it. Yeah. And then Mo <laughs> bought it. George yeah. wanted it. Later in the day, we were just went back in there to play it again. We showed somebody how to play. Again, the beauty of SFG. Random people that don't know each other who walked up and go, mm -hmm. what is this game? Is it you want to play? I'll watch you. And we talked about it. Yeah. We finished the yep. game and he went, well, I'm sold. And he picked up the last one and walked to the cashier. <laughs> <laughs> it's just that kind of environment. And Boop is one of those games. And I learned later, you mentioned they're not too cheap, Mo. I think this one was... 30 bucks, maybe yeah, 35 30 bucks, bucks, something it's like a that. Over 30, yeah. But online, apparently, they've been out of stock for a long time. They're like 70 or 80 bucks online. So wow. I actually got a deal buying it there at the show. Holy cow. And George probably knows this because he went to Amazon when they sold out. So he knows. I, I did. Yeah. yeah. $80 is what they were on. What? And it's when you go to Amazon, there's one thing that you hate to see when you find the thing you want to buy. And that's oh, the yeah. little button that says, see buyer, see all buying options. Oh, right, you're yeah. like, oh, you know shit. you're in trouble. <laughs> right. I'm and there's no now. default option. Like it shows right. no price until you look. <laughs> so apparently it's very popular. And I understand why, because yeah. it's drop dead cute. Yeah. So Boop is the one that I picked up. George, what did, what did you end up picking up? Well, uh, lots of things we know. Which one do you want to talk about? Right. Well, the one that I picked up in oddly the same room that we're talking about for the first two games I oh, picked yeah? up okay. this game. It's available uh, for two to six players. To Mo's game, it's five to 15 minutes worth of playing time. Mm -hmm. And if played correctly, <laughs> it is absolutely 100% possible to injure everybody at the table. Whoa. I had fun okay. watching you play. <laughs> it was so I was, I was much fun. was just watching you guys play. <laughs> it's called Cobra paw okay so again another cat themed mm -hmm. board game mm -hmm. yeah you get a whole bunch of mahjong style graphically laid out domino pieces yeah. that you lay face up on the table that have these little symbols that you would recognize from mahjong they're also in certain colors like one symbol is always green another symbol is yellow one's okay. white red so on and so forth and the little domino, th they're thinner than dominoes, but I'm going to call them that for lack of a better descriptive term. Uh, they have a little divot in the middle of the tile between the two symbols. That's important because as you're playing this game, the rule is you have two dice. These dice that you roll have every single symbol in the game on them. So there's okay. six symbols total. When you roll the dice, whatever combination comes up on your roll is the tile that you're attempting to grab and keep mm -hmm. as your own from all the other players. Ah, I get it. Once you grab this tile, hungry, hungry hippo style, <laughs> it's in your pile. The first person to collect in a two player game, eight tiles in three players or more, it's six tiles. To hit that number wins the game. Mm -hmm. Now, here's okay. the caveat. Just because a tile is now in your possession does not mean it stays there. If we roll those dice oh. and the same symbols come up another time, mm -hmm. anybody, including yourself, has the ability to grab that tile from your pile and claim it as their own. If you don't grab that tile and somebody else does, 
you lose it, it's and gone. the score goes to them now. So you might have to I grab it in defense just to keep it. Not yes. even. Oh, you I see. always do. And I saw that happen several times with George. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so we were playing a game. Uh, Rachel, our, our unpaid intern, mm-hmm. she was playing mm-hmm. along with her husband and my wife. We were all four there. Rachel claimed that she had a shoulder injury and therefore could not uh, claim tiles. Likely story. But she agreed to be the all-time roller, like all-time quarterback if you're playing pickup mm-hmm. football. Uh, she rolled the dice for us, and that allowed us to, you know, search out the tiles and grab them. I think at one point I had five, and both my opponents had one or two apiece. Within like four rolls, I had three, and they each had five or something <laughs> like that. It was bonkers. At some point in one of the games, we all three had five trying to get that six tile. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And it is so fun because all the tiles are black except for the colored symbols. You put them all in the pile in the middle of the table so that everybody can can have access to them, as well as your pile has to be within access of everybody else. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, you are like a terrible player, like all the rules are written like for japanese samurai themed kind of <laughs> oh, stuff so like dishonor on your house and stuff like dishonor, that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah i think moe's favorite part i'll let him say if it is or not but there's a rule in the oh, game yeah, that is. you can play where <laughs> if you touch the wrong tile which happens all the time because you like get confused by the symbols uh-huh. uh, you're not allowed to claim any tiles during that roll of Ooh. the dice and <laughs> It's because you have brought shame to your house, and Rachel especially. She was calling everything. For shame, shame, shame. Boy, shame. <laughs> and my wife, like she got shamed like twelve times in a row. It was terrible, <laughs> but it is a fun game, just like the others that we mentioned. Five to fifteen minutes worth of play. We mm-hmm. bought it immediately. It was like twelve dollars yeah, or something like that. So these, very yeah. affordable. Wow, super cheap. Well worth the money. Yeah, yeah. It's why SFG is awesome because we get to bring home things like this. Mm-hmm. Man, okay. Okay. Well, listener, links to all these games we've talked about, even the crazy expensive boop in case it comes down, it's well worth taking a look at. And that's what's so cool about SFGE. We would likely have not ever even known about, let alone played and owned mm-hmm. any of these games. Yeah. And because we had literally a whole weekend to sit around and just hang out and try them out, what a delight, man. Mm-hmm. All right. Stick around, listener. We'll be right back. Hello. Welcome to Novel Conversations, a podcast about the world's greatest stories. I'm your host, Frank Lavallo, and for each episode of Novel Conversations, I talk to two readers about one book, and together, we summarize the story for you. We introduce you to the characters, we tell you what happens to them, and we read from the book along the way. So if you love hearing a good story, you're in the right place. Our ninth season is coming this fall. Tune in to hear from some of the all-time great authors, Charles Dickens, Jules Verne, F. Scott Fitzgerald, and more. Subscribe to Novel Conversations wherever you listen to podcasts. If you're a diehard Gen X grown-up, you can pledge your support by clicking join on YouTube or by becoming a patron at genxgrownup.com slash Patreon. You say your company's computer system is a hodgepodge? Yes, HodgePodge is the brand that we use here, actually. It's a number of different uh, products that work together. Well, if working together is important, you might consider the Hewlett Packard Vectra PC. It's a better way than HodgePodge. That looks kind of neat. Yeah, uh, we think the graphics on there are kind of appropriate for managing a pizza business. Yeah, I noticed the pie chart. I see that some of your old PCs aren't uh, working. Hmm. No, those are some of our employees. (laughs) (laughs) They look like PCs. There is a better way. Hewlett Packard. Before we get out of this episode, we always like to take just a moment here toward the end to talk about the things that are coming up in the future, the things we're looking at now or looking forward to uh, between now and the next time we get a chance to record. And Mo, why don't we start with you? What do you have on the horizon? Oh, sure. So one of the things I'm looking forward to, not proud, but I'm looking forward to it, is Meg 2. <laughs> not proud. <laughs> not proud. Um, the Trench. That's the, the yeah. full title. The first one was just so campy and funny yeah. and, and ridiculous. And this new one looks more ridiculous, more 
campy. So I'm definitely looking forward to that one. The other thing I'm looking forward to is there's a Good Omen season two on Amazon Prime that has already dropped. Um, oh, I haven't yeah. finished watching it yet, though. But so I'm really looking forward because uh, the first series I loved, they got the same writer to come back to the second season. Same actors came back. I watched the first episode. It's funny. There's only six. So I've got five more to go. But I'm trying to space them out because the strike's going on. So, mm, yep. they, but yeah, so looking forward to finishing that. And the last one was one that actually kind of snuck up on me because I didn't know this was even happening is they're doing a third season of Only Murders in a Building. It's oh, really? Already? August 4th. Yeah, August 4th. Oh my goodness. So it's out. As, as you're listening to this, yeah. it's already out. Oh yeah, wow. it's out as of today. Yeah. Wow. So uh, I, I love the first either. couple seasons. Mm-hmm. I, I love that show. So I said, I was like, I, mean, I heard that they were doing a third season, but didn't realize that it was coming out that fast. So that's that's what I'm looking forward to. Snuck up on me too. Yeah. <laughs> uh, one, I have a feeling it's going to be a horrible movie, but I want to see this Strays movie about the, the oh, dogs with the, the dog with human dogs. voices. Yeah. It was the Rated Gen X trailer review. It is. You took That's a look at that you. one, George, over there. And <laughs> it's a... I'm afraid it's going to be like the good boys. Remember that movie with the kids that looks so great. Maybe we've yeah. seen all the best stuff in the trailer, oh. but I'm going to go because I want to find out. It's got a great out. line in the trailer, though. I'm going to bite his dick off. That's an awesome line for a trailer. <laughs> and there's the thing where the dogs eat mushrooms and the dogs like, could yeah. be my human hands. That cracks me up every time. <laughs> anyway, so that's coming August 18th. Uh, so I'm looking forward to seeing that. It's in the theaters. Um, Solar Opposites, uh, the film that's made by the, uh, the producers of uh, Rick and Morty, has a fourth season yeah. coming oh, August wow. 14th. Now, okay. I'm a bad fan. I haven't watched past season two, not because I don't like it. It's just one of those. I haven't gotten back to right. it, right? There's so many things. I'm glad it's getting more seasons, despite the fact that I've been ignoring it because I will catch up on it. It's a very clever animated series. Uh, it's, it's a cartoon for adults. It's a science fiction thing. It's, it's fun. So it is really <laughs> weird. So that'll be on Hulu coming uh, August 14th. The thing I'm most looking forward to, and looking forward to is an odd phrase. I'm excited for it to get here. I'll be mad when it's over. And that's August 10th is the season two finale of Star Trek Strange New Worlds. No! Oh, no! I am, yeah, okay. So, You're not allowed to look forward to that. You're full yeah, of shit. I, I, I want to see it. I just don't want it to be over. You know, yeah. these it's seasons are really so fast. short. I know. How many it's over episodes already. is that? And, 10 episodes. God, it's the best Trek we've had in 30 years. Yeah, it might awesome. be the best show on television right episodes? Yeah. It's so good. It's so good. Oh, anyway, man. what I do know is that based on the title of the episode and what I've learned so far, we're going to see the Gorn again. It's going to be a big battle okay. kind of thing. Uh, we've had a few episodes that have been cute and funny and dramatic and whatever, but this capper for the season is going to be all Gorn related, and mm, it looks yeah. just the whole show is so good, and the finale looks so good. I'll be Wonder mad if we're to see it get go, a best but... of both worlds type of episode. Oh god, and it's going to be two years before the third season, you know, because the yeah, strike strike that's the yeah. hell of it. If it's a cliffhanger, just go ahead and shoot me. It's crazy. Mm. Yeah. Anyway, that's coming. I'm looking forward to it. I'm also mad that it's over, but there we are. <laughs> so. Yeah. Oh, George, you have anything more upbeat? I'm so depressed now. <laughs> I, I do. <laughs> okay, uh, good. <laughs> first of all, season two of the TV show Killing It, which was oh. the Craig Robinson hunting snakes in the Everglades mm-hmm. comedy show. Yep. That's oh, yeah, starting yeah. on uh, August the 17th on Peacock. Uh, Then we have Billions Season 7, which is also the final season, starting on August 13th on Showtime. This is the high drama, big money people that starred Damian Lewis for like six or five of the previous six seasons. He was missing from the last season. Now he's back for the final season, which will be a lot of fun. But the thing that I'm looking forward to the most... I know it's me, so, you know, this is not really surprising. I'm looking forward to Winning Time, The Rise of the Lakers Dynasty Season mm. 2, oh, okay. season two, which is oh. an HBO show. Yeah, it's uh, on August the 6th. Uh, John, it stars your guy from Wreck-It Ralph, John C. Riley mm-hmm. as Jerry Buss. Uh, yep. All of this is, it's not reality, it's not drama, it's kind of that mix where they take license with what really mm-hmm. happened, but the main points of history are all there like when they win the title and who's on the team and all the subterfuge that seemingly happened (laughs) in between Mm -hmm. it's a great story because it involves a lot of giant personalities uh you've got the characters playing magic johnson 
obviously as the star, uh, Jerry Buss, who John C. Mm-hmm. Riley plays as the owner of the Lakers, who is a crazy personality. And even like uh, people who are represented like Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. So even if you're not a sports fan, you'll mm-hmm. likely recognize most of the characters involved right. in this. Huh. And it's certainly high drama. It's got this kind of breaking the fourth wall aspect every now and then, mm. which is fun. But yeah, it's produced by HBO, so you know it's going to be, you know, they're not pulling any punches. Yeah. And it's a mm. solid show that comes back on August the 6th. Nice. Nice. A lot of good stuff. It, look, there's so much to look forward to despite the strike. So thank goodness right. there's still something. There's something in the pipeline. <laughs> Before we wind it up, I absolutely have to send out our heartfelt thanks to another brand new Patreon supporter. Mm. During the hiatus, we had a few people join us over on Patreon. And this time around, I want to send my thanks to Scott K, who hit up that browser, went over to genxgrownup.com slash Patreon and said, I like what you guys do. You give it away for free. I want to support you to make sure it keeps happening and at the volume and quality that it does. Scott, thank you so much for that. You are joining a legion of tremendous fans who are so supportive and so amazing. And if you're not already, I hope you'll join us over on Discord at genxgrownup.com slash Discord, where we all get together and talk and have a great time. But to you and to everyone else who supports us, we are so, so, so grateful. And you can join this roster again. Just head over to patreon.com slash genxgrownup or the other URL that worked interchangeably. Open up your wallet, look for as little as a dollar a month. You can become part of this roster and support what we do. We're so, so appreciative. I don't know what more I could say about that. And (laughs) Starting this episode, we're going to start to highlight a few more of our patrons, right, Mo? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So I reached out to our patrons and basically gave them opportunity to ask us any question they want. And so what we're going to do is... Whoa, 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 whoa. Hold on. (laughs) Yeah. Statute of limitations has not gone up on some of the things I've done. You can can play the fifth. You can choose not to answer. Yeah, you can choose not to answer. If it's going to incriminate you, don't answer it. Um, (laughs) But basically, uh, because we just thought it'd be fun just to kind of take some of these questions that any of our patrons went for us and answer it and... To kind of get okay. to know us a little bit better. Love it. And if you'd like to put a question to us, all you got to do is become a patron on patreon.com. So the Easy. question this week nice. is from our favorite cat again. She We just had her uh, email at the beginning of this thing. So she actually sent in a question. <laughs> she was the first one to send a question in. She'd be well highlighted in this episode, isn't I she? I know, right? <laughs> it's the cat show. It did is. We, did this become the 1980s Now podcast? <laughs> what just happened here? But the question she posed to us is, what set from a favorite TV show of your childhood do you wish you could have lived in? Okay. Mm. So I'll, I'll kick us off. I'll start off here okay. first. All right. All right. Um, okay. Now, I interpret this as set meaning like not physical set, but just like what world, like, you know, this show takes like place the in setting, this, the setting of the thing. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Mine has to be Orbit City, and that's where the Jetsons live. Oh. Oh. Oh, okay. okay. Because they got flying think cars. Of cartoons. And yeah. I was promised flying cars when I was a kid at this point in my life. Yep. I yeah. don't have them. I'm very upset Fair. about that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I would, and plus everything is automated. They got three day work weeks. I mean, come on. Why would you not want to live there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. George Jessen is a professional button pusher. That's his job, right? He just- <laughs> yeah. I, I, that's kind of me. <laughs> All right. It, so do you have one, George, or way to go? What do you want? What do you want? I, I think you better go. I'm still I'll, thinking I'll go, about this. Yeah. I think if you ask me today, like I would want cheers because just hanging out, you know, having a couple of beers with friends sounds great. But as a kid, which is what Kat asked, and and I'm going to take it literally, she's saying what set, because I have a good answer for that for me. Okay. Okay. I didn't watch this show a lot, but as a kid, I was really mad at Ricky Schroeder. I really wanted to live on the set of Silver Spoons (laughs) because he had a a, a train, he had a centipede cabinet, he had had every toy because he was a rich kid. He lived with this rich family. And, you know, we, my, my parents were awesome and took good care of me and didn't let me know how broke we were, but we were, and we just had, we had nice (laughs) stuff, but not a lot of nice stuff. You know what Mm -hmm. I mean? So like I had an Atari, but not Atari and a ColecoVision, right? Like some kids, (laughs) like freaking Ricky Schroeder had everything. (laughs) Like a pinball machine in his living (laughs) room. Right. All that. So, so when I was a kid, I was definitely envious about the Silver Spoons, just the main living room set where you saw all that stuff. That's awesome. Come up with one, George, what do you think? Yeah. I mean, it's not going to be a big surprise probably to our listeners who have been around for a while. I think I kind of wouldn't mind living in the Dukes of Hazard world. Hmm. It's kind of in the same area of the country that I was born in. All right. And 
I can see myself as an adult having developed all of my uh, mannerisms from people that were on that show, very likely the cussing <laughs> and the gummets and all that kind of stuff goop, that goop, I goop, do. Them damn dick boys. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, you know, if you pin me down to a set, Daisy Duke's uh, shorts is not a bad place to spend your childhood. <laughs> that's that's, that's uh, stretching that the definition counts. a little bit, but, you know, I'll, hey, why not? It was why on not? the show. I mean. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hazard County. She's part of Hazard County. Yeah. So yeah, I all guess right. that works. Yeah. Technically. Fair enough. Yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> hey, all the listeners out there, too, if you have a, a childhood set that you want to live in, write us right in. Let Let's us know. know. I'd like to hear about it. Oh, yeah. Cool. Well, thank you for your question, Kat. Yeah. yeah. So as our inaugural patron question, you won. You won. Well, or maybe you lost. <laughs> you judge. You judge when you lost, lost or won. <laughs> oh, that is going to wind it up for this edition of the show. Don't worry, though. We'll be back in two weeks with another one. But next week is our backtrack. That's where we pick a single nostalgic topic to dig in deep. We tried this out a few months ago. Well received. We're going to jump in with another musical backtrack about a single album. We're talking about Prince's. Purple Rain next week. And as a special note, this coming backtrack is produced and co-written by one of our patrons. So you'll hear about that (laughs) Ah. when that episode gets here. So you do not want to miss that. Until then, I am John. George, thank you so much for being here. Yes, sir. Mo, you know I appreciate you. Always fun, man. Fourth listener, it is you, though. We all appreciate most of all. We can't wait to talk to you again next time. Bye-bye. See you guys. Take care, everybody. Jet X Grown Up is a member of the Evergreen Podcast family. Learn more at evergreenpodcasts.com. Unacceptable for grown ups. Your dinner cannot just be french fries. Basically, life sucks as a grown up. Coolie cool. <clears throat> Media in five, four. Hey, look, we do know how to do it. We're doing it again. <laughs> in five, <laughs> four, three. Hi, this is comedian and writer, and let's be honest, I do a lot of things. This is Dean Archipotus, the host of Whiskey Business, the podcast not so much about whiskey as it is one with whiskey. Yes, we drink and talk about whiskey, but we do so much more with so many interesting people. For example, we talk to comedians like Greg Warren. You know, I don't want to brag, but let's just say I can walk into a Red Lobster and get whatever. You know, I think the pause right there is probably more important than the word. Amazing athletes like boxing champion Buster Douglas. When a fighter's down and he's looking for his mouthpiece instead of trying to get up. That's when I knew it was over. Yeah, Yeah. right? And, yes, Bigfoot chasers. Do you believe in Bigfoot? And if so, does he really eat beef jerky? (laughs) The Bigfoot thing is people have seen these, and and I've seen a lot of compelling evidence about it. It's Whiskey Business with Dino Chipotas. Join us for what we call a good conversation with a good pour. You really can't ask for much more than that, can you, people? Check us out at whiskeybusinesspod.com, a proud member of the Evergreen Podcast Network.